Hello and welcome to the next UKC training panel debate. Hopefully you joined us for the previous one where we discussed the sort of perils and pitfalls of lockdown motivation. But hopefully having watched that, you're going to be super keen and enthusiastic on your training and sort of uh, ready to hear what we've got to say on uh, fingerboarding, um, also known as hangboarding. And um, I'm joined with uh, the same team again. I've got uh, Maddie Cope from Lattice Training with me and also um, Louis Parkinson, Captain Cutloose, the uh, the front man for, for Catalyst Coaching down in London. And um, with hangboarding, we're going to start off. This session is going to be uh, dedicated specifically to beginners. Um, so if you're kind of like bouldering like V7 or above and you've been hangboarding a while, this session won't so much be for you. But hopefully you'll join us for the next one where we'll really take the gloves off and get into the sort of nitty gritty of the nuances of advanced hangboarding protocol. But we're going to swing it right back around for this session and we are going to approach it for people who, you know, people who are just, they're in lockdown, not used the hangboard before, they might even be pretty new to climbing and, you know, they've seen so much information out there, a lot of which seems to conflict and they just want to make a good, safe and solid start. That's going to be the focus of this session. And um, if I may, before I hand over to uh, my, my, my fellow team uh, panel members, I'd like to start with a question uh, which came in to, to UKC in advance of this particular session. It's from um, uh, Bradders, this is uh, his online name. And um, this is what he's got to say. He says, I thought fingerboarding was discouraged until you reached a certain grade. In my head, this was maybe around V5 or V6, though I'm not really sure where I got this from. I've personally got to V5 just by climbing and no fingerboarding whatsoever. Though to progress abru above this, would I need to work on, on my sloper strength, for example? Is this view still generally held? Uh, it was definitely prevailing at my local climbing wall maybe four or five years ago. Obviously, because we can't climb outside at the moment, it's not possible to progress in this way. But I think the general message was that fingerboarding is more likely to injure you. It doesn't really benefit you unless you can climb a certain grade. I don't have any sources to quote, but this is just general hearsay and chat. It would be really good to know what you guys think. Am I right or not? Um, okay, I mean, I think what what better starting? And, um, I mean, Maddie, for example, what, what would you say in response to Bradders? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting place to start. And I think sort of fingerboarding aside, I actually think that this sort of thought pattern prevails in training for climbing as a whole. And I think something that's quite interesting to think about is if you take an example from from somewhere else, maybe take like something from gymnastics and, you know, you take a handstand. And I think we would all probably agree that you can't just go to your first lesson at gymnastics and do a handstand. But I think what they would hope to achieve through going to gymnastics and training in this area would be to see like a logical progression of exercises and movements that they can do this clear pathway to be able to do a handstand you know and I think that that is what climbing um you know is what we should offer in climbing as well and I think that training like supplementary training is part of that picture but because climbing is such a skill-based sport and I would not deny that I think that climbing itself will always form that base of the pyramid when it comes to progressing in our sport and then the question comes it's like at what point in that pyramid can you kind of start slipping in training and personally I think it's really hard to pin this down to a certain grade so for like Bradders I guess I would say I not 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 that I disagree with him but I think that notion that he has that it has to be v5 and v6 to start training I would say that that breaks down for me pretty quickly from my experience and just what I see in the climbing sort of community and population as a whole. So nowadays with climbing, with gyms popping up everywhere, people might have climbed for two years. I work with people who have climbed for two years and they are at really quite a high level. Or people might have climbed for 10 years and they might have gone to climbing once a week for 10 years. And suddenly like, it's quite hard, I think, to think about 
yeah where you are in climbing by like the time that you've been climbing um, and in the same way I think the grade can break down a little bit although I do think that a certain like solid base of just climbing and exploring that movement and that technical aspect of it is really important but I think what I sort of almost I just guess don't like is this almost this moralizing of training it's like this rightness and wrongness of whether you should train or not rather than this just whole mm. spectrum of experience where we say does this thing positively impact my experience in climbing and this doesn't have to be which is what we'll explore in this discussion I think a really high intensity training thing and I think this is where we work as a community and as coaches to try and show a broader variety of exercises that people might really benefit from, but also enjoy. Like personally, I find training enjoyable. And um, as long as it is appropriate and a certain base level of skill has been built up, I think that this is something that can be introduced at a number of levels. Um, yeah, and we'll go on to probably talk about what is appropriate and how to do that. Um, because I think something that I think more and more about as well, um, because I think of myself as someone who probably started training quite late uh, when it comes to fingerboarding. I didn't hang off a fingerboard until I'd climbed 8B. Um, and, you know, I wanted to climb my second 8B. And it was actually after an injury. And I think that that's quite common. Maybe people plateau or they have an injury or something happens that makes them think about their climbing and progressing in a certain, in a bit of a different way. Um, but it's actually quite a privilege to be able to spend hours at the climbing wall and going outside and getting to this really high technical level before you start maybe introducing some things that you can do at home. And I think we're all seeing this right now, right? We've all had our privilege to go to the climbing wall taken away. And we are seeing that we are left with these supplementary climbing um, sort of training exercises. Um, and we want to make that accessible and safe for people to do. Um, and I think that when we start to pin a certain grade or technical level um, to the sort of element of training or wanting to progress in climbing using sort of extracurricular um, exercises, I do think we run a risk and I feel it from talking to some people um, of sort of having this gifted, talented sort of technical master this elusive sort of um, kind of point that we're aiming to before we introduce training and there is a whole mixture of bodies out there and how technical and gifted people can be at movement in climbing so I, th I think I might have sort of like gone off on one a little bit there. <laughs> um, so I guess just to bring it back is that I think there are so many things to be considered and I think and what I hope that people can get from today is that training for climbing, especially in this lockdown scenario when we can't actually climb, can be something made appropriate for yourself and accessible. And it just comes down to sort of taking a proper look at where you are in that, that pathway um, within, within climbing itself. So um, yeah, maybe I, hopefully I sort of, that made some sort of sense. <laughs> there are always a lot of background issues, isn't there? What do you think, Louis? I was going to say I'm I'm completely with with Maddie on this. I think there's like like you say there's a lot of different things to consider, which obviously makes it quite a difficult subject. Um, I previously I'm I'm kind of with Bradders. I had this completely non-defined point in my head where I was like, yeah, 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 this is kind of the point where people are like, I don't know, strong enough or good enough that yes, fingerboarding is now appropriate. And now that I think about it, I have actually changed my mind on this, but there are still things to consider before you just start weighing in with fingerboarding. Previously, I probably, I might've been quite hard line about it with some vague sort of thing of, no, 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 you need to be climbing this long, then it's appropriate to start handboarding. Whereas now I think it's much better to instead work out what you should prioritize. And that still might mean that it's not appropriate to start fingerboarding yet. And kind of by that, I mean that, okay, when we talk about V5, for example, being like this time where you should start fingerboarding, I think a lot of the time when people are saying, oh, no, 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 you don't need to start fingerboarding before you get to V5. Actually, what they mean to explain is there are a lot of other gains that you can make simply by, as you were saying, Maddie, just going climbing and practicing. And I'm sure we'd all say this as coaches, when we see 
less experienced climbers of the wall who maybe aren't at that level yet, a lot of the advice we'd give isn't, oh, you just need to get stronger. A lot of it is learning to be more efficient and to use they, the strength they have more efficiently. And so for those people, I wouldn't want to recommend going fingerboarding or spending their time fingerboarding because as we say, their time, their time is limited. They could use that time climbing to get better. Um, but again, that advice I don't think could necessarily be used as just blanket advice for everyone below a certain grade, because again, Maddie, as you were saying, it kind of depends what type of climber they are. Um, if they're already climbing at a, I don't know, like or something, but maybe you could see as a coach, oh, they, they're climbing pretty flawlessly. Like there's, there's nothing really else that they could focus on other than, yeah, getting stronger fingers, then maybe even though they haven't got to this vague, uh, this vague uh, starting point for fingerboarding that we're talking about, maybe it would be a good time for them to start because they're climbing really well. This would be a better use of their time. Whereas if it was somebody who is only climbing V2 and you can see is like really, really, really strong, then yeah, when we're talking about the best things that this person could do to improve their climbing, getting on the fingerboard wouldn't be the best use of time. Again, all of that obviously changes now that our, <laughs> our access to facilities has changed. So if you were one of those people who is really, really, really strong and who we previously would have advised, no, 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 don't bother with fingerboarding. You just need to improve your climbing skills by going climbing. Obviously, if that's not an option, then yeah, get on the fingerboard and get stronger. Um, so in terms of it actually being applicable and useful to people, that really varies depending on who the climber is and what they're practicing and, and what they need to improve. Um, the other thing that I would have considered in the past was the safety of fingerboarding. And I think I always, uh, I think possibly similar to Brad, as I, when I was learning as coach, always had the impression that, yeah, fingerboarding is very intense and it's, it can lead to a lot of injuries. So no, I don't want to recommend this to beginners. Whereas now actually, yeah, as I say, I've changed my mind a great deal. And I think actually, Fingerboarding or strength training in general, which I previously maybe put as low priority because you can learn, you can improve your climbing by going climbing and having fun doing that. Now, instead, I view it as, oh, actually, you can pick up a lot of like protective strength by having done a load of strength training, a load of conditioning. If, you're, uh, if your strength levels exceed the requirements that you might need, if your foot suddenly slipped and you suddenly loaded your fingers a load more, if you'd been training and had even stronger fingers than the force that would suddenly go into them by having your foot slip, then great, yeah, doing that training was instead uh, a preventative measure for injury rather than something that could have injured you. So I think, yeah, in terms of it being applicable to people, that's more personal. In terms of the safety of it though, that's I think what we're gonna get into in this, uh, in this discussion now is that actually, I don't think it's as unsafe as I previously thought it was. I, th I think we imagine like a pro, a pro climber on the fingerboard trying as hard as they can, and then I imagine, oh, is that appropriate for the V3 climber who's asked me about it? No, that image of fingerboarding, no. But as we're going to discuss, there's a lot of other options. That's right. I mean, uh, we've had a question come through from uh, Ross Ataf and said, you know, how long after you start climbing, is it safe to start fingerboarding? Now, clearly what you guys have already identified is a difference between normal circumstances and lockdown. Under normal circumstances, we would say to people, go climbing, but we're in lockdown, so we can't. So is it safe to start fingerboarding? And I think the clear answer to that is, it depends what type of fingerboarding. You see these, all these myths and hearsays that used to circulate climbing walls come from uh, a former era, m my era, in fact, when I started climbing, when basically people only knew how to fingerboard one way, which was to not warm up and jump on a fingerboard footless. <laughs> no surprise, we all reached the conclusion that fingerboarding got people injured. But now what we understand about fingerboarding is in a whole different league. And you know, we're gonna move on to talk about the fact that you know, theoretically, a beginner can train safely on a hangboard. You know, you can set up hangboarding so that the load levels are actually lower than they would be on a climbing wall. Um, so, you know, we're almost going to turn tables on those. Well, I think that's the direction this discussion will probably go. We're going to turn tables on those, you know, original kind of myths and, and hearsays. And, and so, in fact, that flows nicely into a question from um, Visual Samuel, who says, um, what are some good habits for staying injury free and not getting tendonitis um you know should we do you think we should we should delve into this now a little bit before we we, we move on are you guys happy with with that i mean maddie for example do you want to kick off there yeah yeah for sure and i think it's actually a really 
nice one to kick off with because it means that hopefully when people are starting to explore using the fingerboard or introduce it into their training in this home uh, environment, they're from the very beginning supporting that. I think I would class myself guilty of not doing that and kind of starting to do training without that supporting element. A little bit like you mentioned, Louie, and I think it's a really good point that strength training, I mean, there's actually quite a bit of like research out there to show how effective that is against injury versus some of the more classic ways we think of preventing injury. You know, you're like stood in the gym with your TheraBand doing this or whatever you're doing. Um, and yeah, so I think that this is a really good place to start. I also think Louis touched on an interesting point that if before lockdown, you were one of those climbers, you're, you're quite new to it, or you're not new, but you're still new to finger body, and you actually think that you pull quite hard on your fingers when climbing, like maybe that's what you see when you climb with your friends, you think, oh, they pull a bit less hard with their fingers than me. This might still just be a time of maintenance for you. And I think this is a bit like what Neil was saying, where we have this vision that there's one, there's one view of fingerboarding and it is maximal, hanging with loads of weight, but actually depending on the different types of protocols you use, which we'll probably chat through after this, and maybe the volume that you do, you might actually just be looking to maintain this this like attribute that you have throughout lockdown. And when you go back to climbing, this might be just something that you drop out. Um, and actually that on the point of injury is maybe a good place to start for beginners because this might be something you introduce now. And I think we all sort of agree on this, that injury like in the fingers often doesn't happen on the fingerboard although the fatigue from fingerboarding may be a contributing factor. So if this is something that's been quite new to you, I would say maybe follow some of the advice in this, experiment yourself during lockdown. Then when you go back to climbing, probably drop it out. I think what I've heard a little bit of from last lockdown is people are like, oh my God, I started fingerboarding. I've seen all these gains. They go back to climbing. They're like, oh, I feel really good climbing but there's this fear of losing the gains. So they want to like keep the fingerboarding up. And I think that's where the balance needs to probably be reassessed for people who have been beginners at fingerboarding or who are beginners now. And I think that will be like a pretty good way to prevent injury further down the line. But in terms of like sort of tips to prevent injuries, like right now, like during lockdown, if we're actually thinking about the injuries that you could pick up from fingerboarding, because I think although we all slightly are in agreement that we don't think it's this dangerous training tool, there are injuries that for sure you can pick up by doing a lot of train, uh, training on a fingerboard. It is quite repetitive. The arms are over the head a lot. And I think the first thing to do is, um, you know, listening to the ideas here might be a good way to gain information, but I'd probably go online. There's loads of videos probably about fingerboarding and stuff. Don't necessarily look at the pros, but maybe look at quite a broad range of videos. Look at the hanging position that is promoted. Um, and then also maybe do that position yourself, potentially just on jugs if you're starting out, like not actually on a fingerboard. If you've got someone at home, it'd be great to have them take a picture or you can set up your phone to video yourself. And I do this still with some exercises I'm doing. Take a look at that and see how it looks compared to what you see online. And there is a bit, all our bodies are not the same. They're not textbooks. So there will be a bit of variation, which is why I say to look at like a bit of a range, but this is quite a good way to troubleshoot a potential injury before it comes. So, you know, like three weeks down the line when you've got like quite like a, you know, a bit of niggling in the front of your shoulder. And then you actually realize that the position you're hanging in might be contributing to that. Um, that might be a good way to like start with quite good hanging position and form from the offset. So there's sort of antagonistic work we can do as well. So generally, I guess we're looking at the fingers. So like, obviously, if you're doing a lot of this and you're starting to grip a lot, we want to keep maybe some of the extensors going so you can get like a band around, you know, you don't have to buy the special ones. You can probably pretty much just use a hair bubble or like elastic band and you might want to be working. Yeah, yeah. Or like maybe like your hands in a TheraBand, if you've got that, you can um, make sure that you're maintaining that balance there. Then the elbows are another point that can um, get sort of a bit of that 
take a bit of that repetitive stress during um, fingerboarding. So there's the quite um, classic like elbow um, exercises that we do um, sort of like eccentrics and stuff that could be something to think about and then the shoulders which I think if you're hanging quite a lot you are hanging in the same position and I'd actually say for any beginner with fingerboarding I would start at the shoulders before you're hanging on a fingerboard actually kind of engaging your fingers in a challenging way um, and this could be through just hanging at first maybe you know if people have uh, something like the beast maker 1000 that's got jugs or even just a pull-up bar hanging adding a little bit of weight maybe doing some engagement um, and then working the fingers more separately I actually think if you're starting out then something like um, an edge block uh, again you can either buy them you can make them yourself um, and so you're sort of separating those elements before you bring them together and I think that that is quite a good way because if you hang the edge block down in front of you or by your side, you eliminate that stress on the shoulder. And I think, again, you're looking to build that sort of get your fingers sort of going, get your sh uh, shoulders sort of building up the strength there before you bring them together. Because maybe starting out with all of that in one could be a way that you would pick up an injury actually during the lockdown by starting fingerboarding. And then I think just as with any training, once you're just like doing the antagonist work, once you've like got a really good warm up nailed down, um, which I think we'll go on to talk about separately. So I won't chat on about that too much. I think just a gradual loading process. Um, and this is the same for pretty much anything. You need to work at sort of not your max. I think we think like say the term max hangs, we think these got to be really maximal. But actually a lot of these more um, sort of supplementary exercises, we look to work at a percentage of max so that it's consistent and reliable. And then we gradually over a few weeks or a period of time where potentially you feel that the effort level for you has dropped, you might add a small amount more load. So that might be actually a bit less assistance if you're doing some hanging, or it might be getting to body weight, or it might be adding a little bit weight. Um, I won't go into various exercises here, but yeah, generally like this that. is, yeah, generally this is the rule of thumb for anything. And so I think it's the monitoring and the sort of trying to reflect on your perceived effort there um, is, is sort of really the way to go. Okay, yeah, thanks, Maddie. I mean, that really is the size of it. I mean, you, you pretty much covered it there. The, I mean, the, the main thing I would say in addition would be, um, we, we're all bombarded by stuff that we see online, these like Herculean feats of strength that you see on social media is just not to be tempted to copy any of that and to, to adjust the training to your level. Um, but also um, really to concentrate on what you're doing when you're training. I think there's a lot of distractions at home, especially for parents, but you know, we've all got our share of distractions, but if you can possibly don't try and mix your hangboarding session in with doing all your household chores, doing the washing up, cooking the dinner and all that sort of thing. You know, you're better off just, if you, if you haven't got much time to train, just train for less time, be happy with that, but just do it, like shut yourself away and do it in a very kind of calm, concentrated, focused way, rather than spreading the session out and mixing it in with a load of other stuff. Just because I've seen over the years, I mean, so many tales have come back to me that that's when people have, have, have got injured. Um, okay, so, um, we, I'm sure we'll, more stuff will come up along the way. We might need to sort of come back to that particular angle of this discussion. But the next question is, you know, what, what are the benefits if, this, if that's not obvious? You know, I think we all know that, of course, you can get, you can get, you know, stronger. You can improve your grip strength and your grip endurance on a hangboard. That's pretty obvious. But how does it sort of dovetail in with climbing? Um, let's phrase it differently. What, what might you gain by training on a hangboard that you wouldn't say gain by, by training on, on the walls, Louis? So I think um, benefit of training strength on the hangboard rather than um, climbing on the walls. I, I kind of always opt for climbing on the walls, but I know what the downsides are, which is that yes, it's great. It's slightly more applicable to climbing. I'm learning how to move as I go. But when it comes to actually gaining finger strength, it's nowhere near as measurable. It's a lot less predictable. I can't scale up the difficulty as easily. So when it comes to specifically training finger strength, what's really nice about the fingerboard is that it's uniform. You can 
you can progressively load stuff rather than just trying to do harder climbs and assume that means you'll get more grip strength. Um, so I think it being really, really, um, really uniform, as I say, is the benefit because it allows for much cleaner progression with your strength training. Um, and that'd be the main one. You can also train a load of other stuff on it, but um, I think just keeping it so focused on the only thing I'm doing right now is training my fingers. I'm not also trying to do all this other complicated movement at the same time. Sure. Fantastic. I mean, Maddie, anything to, to add to that? I mean, I know I mean, we're probably going to go in a little bit more in depth at the advanced level on this one, but more, I guess, for, for beginners. Is, um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Louis hit the nail on the head there that sort of like plays back into like, is this something you need? Is that if your fingers are something that is holding your climbing back, even at this, you know, um, even if like you've not been on a fingerboard before, if you feel that when you're climbing, I guess I feel like I have experienced this because my fingers, I would say, are quite relatively weak for um, my climbing. They're definitely something for me to work on. And I think when that's the case, you climb in a style that can sometimes make progressing finger strength on the wall harder. Because I think the reason sometimes that certain people's climbers, uh, certain climbers' fingers lag in strength or is a relative weakness is because maybe they're quite flexible and they get their weight close to the wall and they don't load their fingers as much when they climb or any number of reasons. So I think that was a really good point from Louis that sort of actually stripping that climbing away, whether it's from a stylistic point of view or just like eliminating that technical, fa technical failure and everything else that goes into it. And um, yeah, along with the measurability is really good. I guess just one other thing I think, and it actually plays into the point that you made Neil about being quite focused on what you're doing is that we all want to get to the wall when it opens again <laughs> after work. Um, obviously that's not a case now, but I think sometimes we, we rush to get there. We maybe just like vomit to the climbing wall. We've not had anything to eat. You know, everyone's got these busy lives that they try really hard to fit as much climbing around because they love it. And sometimes in some of those cases, even like if you haven't introduced a fingerboard before, it might be, that post lockdown now that you've had a play with it you think you know what that climbing wall session that I have is not super high quality just because I'm rushing around it's like really busy and potentially going home having a cup of tea <laughs> after work and having a high quality fingerboard session could could potentially be a way for you to actually enjoy the times that you make it to the wall more for sure I mean, the only other thing I'd want to drop in is, of course, this business of um, developing weaknesses within gripping ranges, or to put it more simply, I, I don't think there's a climber out there who doesn't have a preference for a certain type of hold, whether it's small crimps or, you know, open holds or slopers. Relatively few would say that they're kind of equally good at both. So if you're one of these climbers who, you know, prefers to grip with more open and struggles to grip more closed up, then that's clearly an obvious thing that you can work on on, on a hangboard or, or vice versa. You know, you're always crimping up. So try and hang a little bit more open and, and address those kind of disparities in strength. You know, as I say, we will go into that in more detail next next session. But even at a very basic level, I think we can, you, you know, you can see that, of course, when you're climbing, you, you tend to go for the, the holds and the problems that you like and that you're going to do well at. And, um, you know, also, especially when the end goal is to get to the top of the problem, you're going to grip the holds in the way that feels easiest to you. But if you take away that end goal, it's no longer about getting to the top of the problem. It's just about doing a particular exercise. Suddenly it becomes more, more you know, more viable to work on on a particular weakness. And I, I personally believe that's where hangboarding really sits you know mm. next to next to climbing and you know as maddie said i mean look you know she's climbed 8b before touching a fingerboard i mean i know people who've climbed 8c who've never who've never fingerboarded but you know conversely we do see people who develop like almost like horror show weaknesses in their climbing i was one of them because i never used fingerboards in the early stages and i only ever used to crimp i couldn't hang open and, you know, at a later stage in my climbing, I had to really backtrack and develop that more open strength. And I, you know, using a hangboard definitely helped me to, 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 to do that. OK, so um, moving on, you know, and I think there's going to be an element of personal preference here, perhaps, as well as fact um, equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we can't really gloss past this without talking about what you need, because, you know, beginners will be bamboozled by a range of complicated looking resin boards you know everything from some like you know like 100 hold 
thing to, to, to some, you know, conversely, you'll get some coaches and trainers saying, no, all you need is a single wooden campus run. You know, uh, also, you know, bits and pieces like accessories. Do we need to bother with, pulley? you know, we see these pulley rigs and, and you know, straps. That, you know, do we need all this kind of stuff? What do you think, Louis? Uh, oh, it's tricky because, okay, if the question is, do you need it to be able to do some useful training? I would argue, no, you can you can get away with the most basic of stuff. I mean, Mikko Marwem on Instagram posts a lot of stuff that he just does on his door frame. Um, but um, I think the downside of having slightly limited equipment is, I, I would argue that if you only have one edge, yes, there is a lot of training you can do with that. The downside though, is that if you only have the one size of edge, making it harder or making it easier suddenly starts requiring a lot more fat. Um, if it's like, if you find, oh yeah, this small, this small edge I've got is way too hard for me, then you maybe need to start faffing around with getting assistance, rigging up a poly system, or if you discover, oh, actually I'm way too strong for this edge. Now I need to add loads of weight. It can be really, really nice to have a fingerboard, which has loads and loads of edges so that you can quite easily go, oh, these edges are too big. These ones are perfect. Great. I'll use those. So it can, it, having more facilities can just reduce the amount of time you spend faffing around trying to get things to the right difficulty. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's necessary to have like the, the weights, the pulley system, uh, all these different edge sizes. You can do it with whatever you have available. I think naturally, though, it might get easier the more you have. Maddie? Yeah, um, I guess I'll go um, from the point of view of someone starting out, because I think, as Lou oh. said, there's all these different edges. There's like a million fingerboards out there, probably. But if you are sort of really first like first time I'm trying to get to grips with it I actually think it's really useful to have um whatever you go for a set of jugs or a or a pull-up bar like something large that is actually not very limiting for your fingers but allows you to work on your shoulders like I said before and then I do actually think and this does depend on how uh, on what level you're at but I think having some sort of edge that you have made that eliminates the shoulders is a really useful way to reduce that sort of impact on numerous areas of your body and try and reduce that repetitive strain and allow you to really target the different areas. Because essentially, if we're wanting to work on our grip strength, we don't want our shoulders to be limiting that. So it might be if you're starting out, you want to build those up first. Um, you can obviously buy them. Honestly, I think people could probably make them if they had a bit of wood lying around. You know. This doesn't have to be expensive if you don't mind probably doing a little bit of DIY. Um, and then you would be either attaching weight to that edge. Some people don't have enough weight. So you could actually attach some sort of sling or something to it and stand on that. And then you can just pull into the edge and that will just allow you to get a bit of a feel for getting those fingers working in, as Neil said, a range of grip positions. And I actually think on that point, you really, that's a really good point from Neil because when it comes back to injuries, which is often a common concern at this like beginner level, mixing up the grip type, like between that open and half crimp, is a really good way to not overstress any particular position. And then alongside um, like maybe some really like the much bigger holds that allow you to just work on your shoulders, I think probably two sizes of edge. And like, I guess if you're a beginner, maybe yeah. a larger edge, 40, 30 mil, and then maybe a 20 mil edge, which can be a campus rung again these sort of sizes loads of different um options out there and i think that gives you the option to a bit like louis said you can as you progress you can reduce the edge size rather than needing to add more weight and then um yeah pulley systems can be complicated something i actually personally do in my warm-up but this could be useful is you don't pulley system takes off weight but what you can also do is just lower your weight into the fingerboard this way you keep your feet on the ground and you can actually just pull for the certain amount of time for whatever protocol you're going for. Um, and that is sort of like a way to get around needing resistance bands or a pulley for assistance. For sure. No, excellent. Not much I'd want to add to that. Only that I think if you do make a commitment to getting a decent set of equipment, you'll you'll get into the training more you, and you won't experience limitations. I mean, I think you, you, you guys have covered that. Um, you know, if you, you haven't really got much there, you got 
like one rung and no calibration equipment, it's not going to be a very fun session. You know, oh, almost like maybe. getting into it with this kit and playing around with it makes the session become more interesting and you start to realise, you know, the scope for the training and, and, and what you can do. Okay, so we've looked at the kind of, um, you know, how you get started um, and some basics on avoiding injury and the equipment that you need. So we're going to take a break there and we're going to pick up next session where we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty of the training, which is probably the bit that you've been uh, most waiting for. So thanks to Maddie and Louie for joining us. We'll see you for the next one.